Shaktalakaya Chaksur Militanjena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bayevacha Patita Nam Pavan Hibyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadara Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavanda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 You know I'd like to share the screen Who's the host as far as I made you the host, you can directly set the screen. Huh? Maharaj, I directly made you the host. I don't want to be the host. The I don't know how to use it. I haven't done it before. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. Somebody else has to be the host. But I need to share the screen. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. Maharaj, actually, uh, I may do the host. You can directly share the screen, Maharaj. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, how many devotees are here tonight? Uh, Maharaj, five devotees, uh, four devotees joined so far. Devotees are joining. So, we can start with the class. Okay. Now, uh, this this will be the last class in this unit, so we want to try to cover two chapters tonight. Okay. Because we're supposed to finish one unit in five classes. So according to the schedule, I'm supposed to do two chapters tonight. It will be 12 and 13. And then do you have a test after the, this, or do you, can, we, can we go on to the next unit? Are you supposed to have a test tomorrow? Who's coordinating this unit? Where is he? He's not online, but uh, we have not... And we don't have any communication regarding test tomorrow. Okay, so we'll go on tomorrow with another class. We'll just keep going. If he hasn't communicated anything, certainly we can't afford to miss a day. I don't have time. I, we have to do the class tomorrow. So we'll have class on, we'll keep going to the next unit. But this, this unit finishes with these two chapters, chapters 12 and 13. Okay, and then we'll go on 14, we'll hear about Chitra Ketu. All right, so we, we heard in the last class, last week, we heard about the wonderful transcendental qualities of Vritasura. Right? What was his, what quality, what was the, what, what were these wonderful qualities? Which quality did you fi find was very inspiring in him? He was not disturbed. Not disturbed? By what? Yeah. By his prayers, he was praying four verses up there to the Lord, we were praying. Sorry, I, I couldn't understand what you said. <coughs> He was uh, praying to the Lord, like that. What was he praying for? He was praying. He was praying to be uh, to go to his abode, Lord's abode. Okay. Anything else? And even if Indra was uh, um, prepared to kill him, but uh, he was inviting him to kill him by using thunderbolt. He was not afraid of death. He wasn't afraid of death, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
All of his other demon friends, they'd run away from the battle. When they yeah. saw that they were not able to defeat the demigods, they'd all run away. So Vritasura was surprised. He thought they were supposed to be Kshatriyas, but they were cowardly. And what happened to Vritasura? No, but up in the last chapter, what we had chapter yeah. 11, what had happened? Yeah. Parikit Maharaj was surprised how uh, he was uh, praying to the Lord in the, in the battlefield. Can somebody else tell me what happened to Vritasura in the course of the fight? Yeah, he got disassembled, he lost his hands and he was still continuing to fight and he was, even though he knew that he's a devotee, he was still pretending to be a demon, that is interesting because he was so enlightened and Krishna conscious but still he acted as a demon, he took his job very serious and fought against Indra which was a reaction also of, to Indra's misbehavior, so he saw it probably I could say as, as his mission, he knew, okay, I'm a devotee, but still my job is now to be the reaction of uh, Indra's misdeeds, and he fought. Yeah, now Indra, he, he, Indra had cut off one of his arms. He cut off one of the arms of Vritasura with his thunderbolt, right? When Vritasura had thrown a wep some weapon at Indra, Indra cut the weapon to pieces and at the same time he cut off one of his arms. But Vritasura was not disturbed, although he lost an arm. And he's, instead he's, pre he's talking to Indra. He's talking to Indra about, his, well, first of all what happened was Indra had dropped the thunderbolt. but. Vritasura waited, he told him, pick it up, it's okay, he said, pick it up. Indra was feeling that he was defeated because it, the, uh, Vritasura had knocked the thunderbolt out of his hands. But Vritasura instead told Indra, oh, it's okay, pick up your thunderbolt, pick up your thunderbolt and use it, you can use it to kill me. So Vritasura didn't want to take any advantage over Indra at all. In fact, he, was, he wanted Indra to use his thunderbolt weapon to kill him. And so, uh, Vritasura was uh, so detached about the life and the death situation that he was just encouraging Indra that you definitely, he was telling Indra, you definitely have the right weapon, you can kill me. Go ahead, use it, throw your thunderbolt. Like this he was encouraging Indra. Indra of course was not feeling so much inclined to do anything like that. But anyway, we'll go ahead and let's look at what happens here in chapter 12.
So Vritasura considered death in the battle preferable to victory. Uh, why would he think like that? Why would he think death is better than victory? Yeah, one reason would be what? Well, you explained he could, that he could go back to Godhead, right? That he wants to go back to Godhead. So by being killed, he'll be able to get out of his demon body. But that's another reason to want to be killed, because he's in the body of such a demon. So he wants to give up that body, and at the same time, he knows that when he gives up that body, he's going to go back to Godhead. So, he's eager to die. And Sukadev Goswami continues in the first verse, he vigorously took up his trident and with great force attacked Lord Indra, the King of Heaven, just as Kastuba, or Kataba, Kaitaba, just as Kaitaba had forcibly attacked the Supreme Personality of Godhead, when the universe was inundated. So we're given an example that how the demons sometimes attack the Lord. So it's compared like that, that Vritasura picked up his trident and he comes to attack Indra. And then Vritasura, the great hero, he whirls his trident, which had points like the flames of a blazing fire at the end of the millennium. And he threw it at Indra, roaring, O oh, sinful one, thus shall I kill you. So although Vritasura uh, wanted to be killed, he didn't give up making an attempt to try to kill Indra. And you see, he's quite... Uh, determined in his uh, endeavor, in his fight with Indra, he's trying to kill Indra. And he threw his uh, trident at him. But, of course, Indra has got his thunderbolt weapon. King Indra, unafraid, cut it to pieces with his thunderbolt. Simultaneously, he cut off one of Vritasura's arms. Oh, so, oh, so this is where he, he, so I was thinking it was in the previous chapter, but in the previous chapter he hadn't, he still had two arms. But now one of the arms has been cut off and uh, it's described how his, his arm was as thick as the, the body of Vashuki, the king of the serpents. So he could understand, you know, he, he had this really thick, heavy arm. So this was the first uh, successful attempt of Indra to kill Vritasura. He didn't actually kill Vritasura, but he cut off his arm. So Vritasura angrily approaches Indra and struck him on the jaw with the iron mace. And he struck the elephant, Indra's elephant also. And Indra dropped the thunderbolt from his hand. Oh, so I was describing these incidents. They're both in this, in this chapter. I thought they were in the previous chapter. All right, so the... the the attempts of Indra and Vritasura to kill each other is being described. So Vritasura got one arm cut off and then he fights back and he knocks back. He knocks. What happened again? It was described. He, he, with his iron mace, he struck Indra on the jaw, and at the same time he struck the elephant, Airavrata, and Indra dropped a thunderbolt from his hands. All right? So when he dropped the thunderbolt, the demigods in heaven 
they were appreciating Vritasura's uh, strength and his power in fighting. And when they, when they saw Indra drop the thunderbolt, then they were worried for his life. And they were saying, alas. So, then text 6, having dropped the thunderbolt from his hands in the presence of the enemy, Indra was practically defeated and was very much ashamed. He dared not pick up his weapon again. Vitrasura, however, encouraged him, saying, take up your thunderbolt and kill, some, kill your enemy. This is not the time to lament your fate. So these are, the, this is the wonderful quality of Vritasura. How he doesn't want to take any unfair advantage over Indra and their fighting. So he's exhibiting the very nice qualities of a Kshatriya who fights according to the codes of Dharma, that you should fight on equal levels. He wants Indra to be armed. Even though Vritasura has lost one of his arms, still he, he wants Indra should have his thunderbolt weapon. All right, and then text number seven, we hear about Indra, or Vritasura speaking to Indra, and he's encouraging Indra. He's teaching him the philosophy of which a, a, someone fighting should have, or not only someone fight, anybody acting on behalf of the Lord, what should be their mood in performing their activities. And he explains it, being dependent and being obliged to accept material bodies, beleaguerant subordinates are sometimes victorious and sometimes defeated. Why? Because we should understand the personality of Godhead is the cause of everything. He is the cause of creation, maintenance and annihilation. And he is the cause of victory and defeat. And we will see this, you can see here in the purple of text number 7, Prabhupada is giving different evidences from particularly Bhagavad Gita, how we should perform a duty and don't be attached to the result. Don't think you can always be victorious. But what is important is to do your duty. Everyone should work on behalf of the Lord. Don't be attached to the result. Perform your duty with detail.
attachment. And Prabhupada quotes Bhagavad Gita uh, eight to, uh, or 327 Prakriti Kriyamanani, right, that verse, and then he also speaks about uh, Bhagavad Gita, uh, there's a verse, Karmani Evadikaristi, right, that you should do your duty without being attached to the result. That's quoted also there in the purport. Perform your duty, don't be attached to the result. So like that, there are many verses about karma yoga in the Bhagavad Gita. And this point is being explained here by Vrita Sura. He was encouraging Indra, don't be attached to the results, just be attached to working on behalf of the Lord and offer the results of your work for his pleasure. That is the real m mood which you should have. So victory or defeat, that's not in our hands. You may be the better fighter, but you may not be victorious. So victory and defeat, that is, the results are given by the Lord. Don't be attached. That's important. Only, our only duty is to work sincerely so that our activities may be recognized by Krishna. Yeah, Prabhupada goes on there at the end of the purport. He describes what should be the mentality of a devotee in Krishna consciousness. Right? He said, Prabhupada writes there at the end of the purport, this verse is very instructive for sincere workers in the Krishna consciousness movement. We should not be jubilant in victory or morose in defeat. We should make a sincere effort to implement the will of Krishna or Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And we should not be, uh, we should not be concerned with victory or defeat. Our only duty is to work sincerely so that our activities may be recognized by Krishna. So this is the mood which a devotee in Krishna consciousness should have. The results of the work are not in our hands, but we make a sincere effort to try to do something which is pleasing to Krishna, to give pleasure to Krishna. So Vritasura is speaking in that kind of manner to Indra. He's telling Indra, you know, victory, you dropped the thunderbolt. Okay, you know, I've injured you and I've injured Ayravrata. Don't cry about it. Go on, you've got to do your duty. You have to go on and fight. And he continues speaking in this way for several verses. Right? Text number eight. All living beings in all the planets of this universe, including the presiding deities of the planets, are fully under the control of the Lord. They work like birds caught, they work like birds caught in a net who cannot move independently. <laughs> so this example was given. So even the presiding deities of the planets are under the control of the Lord. They're also like birds in the net, even though they may have a big position in the planet. So it's an interesting, interesting explanation. Prabhupada writes in the purport, the difference between the suras and the asuras is that the suras know that nothing can happen without the desire of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Whereas the Asuras cannot understand the Supreme Will of the Lord. It's a very clear distinction, right? The, 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 asura, the, the, the Suras, meaning the demigods and the devotees, they know that everything is a desire of the Lord. But the demons, they cannot understand this. They're thinking 
everything is there by their efforts. They think they can be independent of the Lord. So the demons are always fighting with the asuras or the demigods. So devotees have to learn, we have to remember everything the con under the control of the Lord. We just simply have to depend on Him. And at the same time do our work, make an effort. It's not that we can just sit back, just like Krishna told Arjuna to fight. Krishna didn't fight for Arjuna. Arjuna had to fight himself. And at the end of the purport, Prabhupada said, whether we are defeated or victorious, the Supreme Lord is always victorious because everyone acts under his direction. So these are important points to remember in the course of our everyday activities. Wherever there is Krishna, and Arjuna, there is victory, morality, extraordinary power and opulence. So we just have to have that faith and work under his direction. It may take some time before we actually see the result and see the victory, but we should not be discouraged. And then text number nine, Vrita Sura is continuing speaking, preaching to Indra. He's saying everything is under the, it's all subject to the superintendence of the Supreme Lord. Not knowing this, foolish people think the dull material body to be the cause of their activities. And then text 10 continues talking about the wooden doll that looks like a woman. Just like they will make these dolls and they'll make them out of grass or leaves or wood. So they cannot move unless, they're, they're, unless some uh, puppeteer is there to pull the strings, to make them dance. So it, it depends on the person who's handling it. The doll can dance if somebody's handling it nicely. They can make the doll dance by pulling the different strings which are attached to the limbs of the doll. So in the same way, we are like that. We are all under the control of the Supreme Lord. And Prabhupada's prayer, when Prabhupada went to America, he wrote about, he said, Oh Lord, now make me dance, make me dance, make me dance.
हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा महाराज या हरे कृष्णा प्रभु ओके so we want to go on to chapter 13 tonight we heard about the death of ritasura and now we're going to hear about indra getting the sinful reactions sinful reactions for killing a brahmana right ritasura although he was in the body of a demon he was born the son of twasta twasta was a brahmana and so in that that sense vritasura was a brahmana and of course not only was he born in that brahmana family but he was a great devotee he was the topmost brahmana he was a very pure vaishnava although he was in the body of a demon and indra had killed him so indra after killing vritasura we will read what happens but let's go through these verses na uh, sukadeva goswami says indra was charitab charitably disposed when vritasura was killed all the presiding deities and everyone else in the three planetary systems was immediately pleased and free from trouble everyone that is except indra now indra had killed vritasura all everyone else was happy but indra was not happy why not because he had killed a great devotee he killed someone who is the topmost brahmana the devotees are the topmost brahmanas so this certainly affected indra's consciousness and he has to suffer the sinful reactions for it of course indra was encouraged to kill the demon he was even given instruction by the lord himself lord narayan had appeared to him and told him how he could kill vritasura the instructions came from the lord but still indra had to get some reactions he had to suffer the reactions for killing the brahmana now previously he had killed vishwarup he killed vishwarup at that time he did it in a manner you know it was a it was a he he did it without without thinking very much about it he did it it was uh, on the spur of the moment that when he saw that vishwarup was offering oblations to the demons on behalf of the demons he became angry and he became worried about losing his position as king of heaven so that was when he cut off the three heads of of uh, vishwarup so he got reactions for that but that time he gave a, he gave the sinful reactions away to other people remember he gave who did he give the sinful reactions to women trees water and uh, land yes good yes he gave away the the, the reactions to those four different th things so that way he got relief for, from his sinful reactions but this time it's more serious it's more serious because he's uh, he he he's, he's he's doing it with the intent you see he he had hesitated to kill to to kill vritasura but he'd been told that it's okay you can nullify the reactions we'll do a yagya for you we'll do a yagya to atone for your killing of the brahmana so he was committing sin on the strength of the holy name 
he was thinking that he, w he would do some pious activity to counteract the sinful reactions. So that's very sinful. To commit sin on the strength of the holy name is a great sin. So Indra was, he got this kind of reaction. But at the same time, remember, Vritasura was a big demon and he was giving trouble to the universe. And he'd been told by the Lord how to kill him. And <laughs> so, but still he has to get some reaction. And we're told how he got the reactions. So the demigods, they were happy. They, they were telling Indra to kill the demon, but Indra had to do it and he gets the reaction. The so demigods, they were happy to see the demon dead, but Indra, he had to carry the reactions for it. All right, so... Nobody spoke to Indra. <laughs> Text number two. They, none of the demigods, they, they didn't even thank Indra. They, weren't, they, do, they were just happy. The demon's dead. Indra had to do all the dirty work for them. And they didn't even thank him. And so he was morose. He was unhappy. And so Maharaj Parikshit is asking Sukadeva Goswami in text number three, he said, what was the reason for Indra's unhappiness? I want to hear. And when he killed Vritasura, all the demigods were happy. Why then was Indra himself unhappy? And Prabhupada writes in the purport, therefore no one of real culture, therefore no, 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 and, and, therefore in terms of real culture, in terms of real culture, one should not be considered a demigod or demon simply according to birth. It's not the birth which is important, although birth is an advantage, but that's not the only criterion. And at the end of the purport, Prabhupada writes, a millionaire may very easily possess hundreds and thousands of dollars. But a person with hundreds and thousands of dollars is not necessarily a millionaire. Vridasura was a perfect Vaishnava and therefore he was also a Brahmana. Right? So a millionaire has hundreds and thousands of dollars. Somebody has hundreds of thousands of dollars. He's not, he may not have a million. He's not a million. But Vridasura he, he was a Vaishnava. So one who is a pure Vaishnava, he's also a Brahmana. He's a perfect Brahmana because he's a pure-hearted Vaishnava. Vaishnava is superior to the position of a Brahmana. And that's why they give the sacred thread to the devotees. Because one who is a devotee, he is also a Brahmana. So the, when, when it's seen the person is strictly following the regulated principles, then they're fit to be initiated as a Brahmana. And Prabhupada also said nowadays, he said, uh, Brahmanas should also study the scriptures. They shouldn't be ignorant. They shouldn't be illiterate. So we asked the devotees wanting second initiation, they should study Bhakti Shastri. They should have studied the Bhakti Shastri course. And that way they get some knowledge, they know something. And without studying the scriptures, they're not really Brahmanas. And the devotees, the topmost Brahmanas. We've got different kinds of Brahmanas. Some Brahmanas are just Jati Brahman, Brahmans by birth. They don't know anything, they don't follow anything. And you've got Brahmana Pandits, they know some scriptures and so on, but they're not devotees. And we have Vaishnava Brahmins, Vaishnava Brahmins, devotee Brahmins. This is the real Brahmana. So Sukadeva Goswami is replying to Maharaj Pariksit's questions. Everybody was happy. 
seeing the death of Vritasura. They'd asked Indra to kill him, and Indra had done it. Indra replied, when I killed Vit Vritasura, I received, that, that's pre, when I killed Vishwarup, I received extensive sinful reactions. But I was favored. I gave my sinful reactions to the women, land, to the trees and to the water. And so I was able to divide the sins among them. Now I've killed Vritasura, another Brahmana, how shall I free myself from the sinful reactions? It was more serious. Sukadeva Goswami said, hearing this, the great sages replied to Indra, O King of Heaven, do not fear. We shall perform an Ashwamedha sacrifice to release you from any sin you may accrue by killing the Brahmana. See, they were thinking they'll do an Ashwamedha Yajna and then this way get rid of the sins. That is very bad to think like that, to do sinful activities and nullify it by killing the, by doing pious activity. You can't do that. But anyway, the, the Rishis are talk, telling like this to Indra, by performing the Asman, Aswamedha Yajna, you please the Supreme Lord who is a super soul. And it says, one can be relieved even of the sinful reactions for killing the entire world, not to speak of killing a demon like Vritasura. So that's, do the Aswamedha Yajna, very powerful. But still, you have to worry about that he'd done this sinful thing. He wasn't an ordinary demon, he was a great devotee, So the sages continue, one who has killed a brahmana, or one who has killed a cow, or one who has killed his father, mother, or spiritual master, they can all be freed from all sinful reactions simply by chanting the holy name of Lord Narayan. <laughs> do you get that? Do you hear that? Just chant the name of Lord Narayan and get free. You, do, you can do any killing all these people. Is it true? No, of course not. That is committing sin on the strength of the holy name. Very bad to think like that. Anyway, they're telling Indra like this, you know, he was a demon, he was disturbing the whole universe, so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> so we'll read a little bit here from Prabhupada's purport. <laughs> Uh, this means that by, by once chanting the holy name of the Lord, one can be freed from the reactions of more sins than he has committed or than he can imagine performing. What then is to be said of those who chant the holy name regularly or worship the deity regularly? For such, purified, for such purified devotees, freedom from sinful reactions is certainly assured. The Lord's holy name certainly has the potency to neutralize all sinful activities. But if one repeatedly and intentionally commits sins while chanting the holy name, he is most condemned. So this is important points here. You cannot just simply do these things, take advantage of the holy name to do sinful activities. It's, that's very sinful. Thank you. So uh, then again, you get the verse, Sukadeva Goswami's verse from his prayers in the second canto that the power of the devotee can deliver one from all sins. Even sinful persons can certainly be purified if they chant the holy name of the Lord under the direction 
of pure devotees. So that's the point. You need the association, you need to be guided by pure devotees to learn when to chant and why you can chant and why you should chant. Not that you can do sinful activities and counteract the karma by chanting the holy name. Such purpose, purposefully devised atonement, however, cannot relieve the performer of sinful acts. This will be seen from the following verse. Sukadeva Goswami said, Encouraged by the words of the sages, Indra killed Vritasura. And when he was killed, the sinful reactions for killing the Brahmana certainly took shelter of Indra. You cannot expect you can do sins and get away from it, get away with it. Hmm. Formerly, he had killed one Brahmana, Vishwarup, out of circumstantial anger. But this time, following the advice of the sages, he killed another Brahmana purposefully. Therefore, the sinful reaction was greater than before. And later on in the purport, the planned execution of sinful deeds on the strength of chanting the holy name of the Lord or undergoing prayaschit atonement cannot give relief to anyone, even to Indra or Nahusha. Nahusha had taken the place of Indra. Nahusha is also a demigod. And when Indra was absent, Nahusha took his place, but he also got in trouble. So, following the advice of the demigods, Indra killed Vritasura, and he suffered because of his sinful killing. Although the other demigods were happy, he could not derive happiness from the killing of Vritasura. Indra's, Indra's other good qualities, such as tolerance and opulence, could not help him in this grief. One cannot be happy by committing sinful acts, even if one is endowed with material opulences. So there are many examples like that, people who have a lot of power and opulence, they do sinful things, they cannot be happy. And it happened, Indra is chased by the sinful reactions. The sinful reactions appear before him like a chandala woman a woman of the lowest class and she was very old and the limbs of her body were trembling and she had tuberculosis and her body, her body garments were all covered with blood. People with tuberculosis often they will spit up blood and they have blood oozing from their different sores on their body and breathing was unbearable, fishy smell, polluted the whole atmosphere and she was calling out to Indra, wait, wait. So Indra saw her, he could understand she is the personification of this sinful activity. He ran. He went to the sky, but she came there, and wherever he went, she was there. At last, he went over to the Manasa Sarova Lake, and he went to the Manasa Sarova Lake, and there he hid in the fiber of a lotus flower. And he remained in the fiber of the lotus flower for 1,000 years in the subtle fibers of the stem of a lotus. 
At that time, the demigod Agni used to send some foodstuffs for his share from the yagya. But because the fire god, the fire god cannot go near water, could not enter the water. So Indra was not able to get much food. And so Indra was practically starving. So this is the difficulty which he had to undergo as a result of killing a brahmana. Because he did it purposefully with the thinking that he could atone for it by doing yajna. And while he was away, at that time Nahusha took his position. And Nahusha became also blinded by the opulence, by, by the power, and he made propositions to Indra's wife. And later on Nahusha also got reactions, he became a snake. That was the result of his sins. So Nahusha had to suffer for his pride, for his foolishness, because of his lust to enjoy another person's wife, makes life, he had to become a snake. All right, so Indra, Indra was in the, 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 this fiber of the lotus for a, a thousand years, but during that time he was protected by the goddess of fortune, who is Lord Vishnu's wife, and she resides in the in the in, in this the, that uh, lotus cluster at Manasa Sarova. So in this way, Indra was protected, and Indra's sins could not affect him. Indra was ultimately relieved of all the reactions of his sinful deeds by strictly worshipping Lord Vishnu. And then he was called back to the heavenly planets by the brahmanas and reinstated in his position. So this is how Indra finally got relieved from his sinful reactions. But initially he had to suffer, he had to take the reactions. But he was fortunate because he was able to take shelter of the goddess of fortune at the Manasa Sarova Lake. But still he had to spend time there. And then after undergoing the austerity there for 1,000 years, then he was able, only then he was able to go and take up devotional service to worship the Supreme Lord. And he had to worship the Supreme Lord very carefully, very seriously. And this way he got relieved of all of his sinful reactions by the worship of Lord Vishnu. And so he was called back to heaven. And when he went back to heaven, then the brahmanas approached him and they initiated him into a horse sacrifice. They did the Ashwamedha Yajna to give pleasure to the Supreme Lord. Yajna is meant for the pleasure of Vishnu. So they, they performed the Ashwamedha Yajna and this way Indra was relieved of all of his sins because he had worshipped the Supreme Lord in that sacrifice. And Sukadeva Goswami says, although he had committed a gravely sinful act, it was nullified at once by that, sacri by that sacrifice, just as fog is vanished by the brilliant sun sunrise. Okay, and then text 21. King Indra was favored by Marichi and the other great sages. They performed the sacrifice just according to the rules and regulations, worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Super Soul, the original person. Thus Indra regained his position and was again honored 
by everyone. All right? So we hear what happened. In this very great narrative, there is glorification of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Narayan. There are statements about the exaltedness of devotional service. There are descriptions of devotees like Indra and Vritasura, and, uh, and there are statements about King Indra's release from sinful life about his victory in fighting the demons. By understanding this incident, one is relieved of all sinful reactions. Therefore, the learned are always advised to read this narration. If one does so, one will become expert in the activities of his senses. His opulence will increase and his reputation will become widespread. One will also be relieved of all sinful reactions. He will conquer all his enemies, and the duration of his life will increase, because this narration is auspicious in all respects. Learned scholars regularly hear and repeat it on every festival day. So these are the wonderful benedictions which are offered to devotees for hearing and repeating this wonderful pastime of the appearance of Vritasura and how Indra kills Vritasura and how Vritasura goes back to Godhead and then finally how Indra becomes relieved of his sinful reactions. All right, so we have a couple of hands up here. Yeah, is it? Prabhu, you have your hand up, is it? Huh? Yes, Bill. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. Maharaj, uh, you said that a millionaire is having uh, hundreds and thousands of dollars, but uh, another person having hundreds and thousands of dollars may not be a millionaire. That I couldn't understand, Maharaj. Well, a millionaire has more than, a hundred, than hundreds of thousands of dollars. He has thousands of thousands of dollars, right? Yes, Maharaj. Hundreds, <laughs> hundreds and thousands of dollars is not equal to a million. So the mil millionaire has got more than hundreds of thousands of dollars. In the same way, a Vaishnava is greater than a Brahmana. So one who is a Vaishnava, if he's a real Vaishnava, he's automatically a Brahmana. Prabhupada is giving this example. Just like we could give it another way, one who has a hundred dollars, he also has fifty dollars and twenty dollars. But if you have fifty dollars, you don't have a hundred dollars. You only have fifty dollars. So it's the same thing. Somebody has hundreds and thousands of dollars, but it's not millions. Somebody who has millions, he has more than hundreds and thousands of dollars. The so one who is a Vaishnava, he is automatically a Brahmana. But one may be a Brahmana, he is not necessarily a Vaishnava. And Prabhupada said, not easy thing to be a Vaishnava. Is it clear? Yes, Mother. Thank you, Mother. Yes, Prabhu. Another hand is up there. Uh, yes, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, Bob. the offense committed uh, upon the lotus feet of Vaishnava is a great offense that we had studied from different Shastri injunctions that Vaishnava cannot be mitigated, cannot be resolved by way of atonement or by way of any pious activities, even like Asumati Jagya, because that is like, uh, like uh, uh, Madhva Matta means uh, an elephant. Uh, when an elephant enters, after taking bath, 
he again uh, spreads sands over his body and uh, his batting is meaningless. Similarly, Vaishnava Bharad is a very uh, great, uh, unsurmountable offense. But how Indra, just by uh, simply um, sincerely worshipping Lord Vishnu, resolved the uh, problem of Vaishnava Bharad, it's a... Well, you have to understand the whole situation that Indra was also encouraged to kill Vritasura. The Lord had personally told him how to do it. He told him, you want to kill this demon? You have to get the bones from the Dichi and make a weapon, then you can use that to kill him. So the Lord was aware that this Vritasura has to be killed. So Indra was given the job to kill. At the same time, you kill a Brahmana, you get reactions. So Indra showed also, he got reactions for killing that Brahmana. He had to suffer, he had to do, he had to go away to Manasarova Lake, be in the stem of the lotus for a thousand years, could not get, he's practically starving and hunger, could not get his share of sacrifice. He, he went, underwent all that austerity because of just to atone for purifying. But he'd been told to kill. The, the, all the demigods had been telling him, and the Lord had told him how to kill the demon. So, yeah, yeah, it certainly, uh, the, uh, Indra was, in some ways, he, he, why he should be held responsible. He was the, the king of heaven, he was doing his job. But still, because he was a brahmana, because he was fighting a brahmana and he killed a brahmana, he, he had to suffer, he had to get some reactions. And so it wasn't just simply so straightforward that he just worshipped the Lord. But worship of the Lord is, of course, ultimately very powerful. And when he did worship the Lord, then he was able to get relief from the reactions. Right? Not... Uh, but Maharaj, yeah. Uh, in Amrish Maharaj, first times, uh, Durbasa then apologized from Amrits Maharaj, Lord Vishnu refused him. That's a uh, burning example to learn and understand that Vaishnava Bharat cannot be, cannot be de-offended, that means cannot be resolved. But uh, because this story is quite different, so it is understood in a different way, but still my doubt is... What should the... Uh... Um, because once it is um, strictly stated that unless one apologizes from the Vaishnava, so the Vaishnava Aparat cannot be, cannot be, uh, yeah, solved. So here, Vritasu is dead, he had already gone to the spiritual world, so apologizing is also not possible. So, solution is that if one will sincerely worship Vishnu, so this problem can be solved. Yes. Yeah, certainly take shelter of Lord Vishnu solves all the problems. As you said, you know, we could say that Indra never even actually killed Vritasura. Vritasura was sitting, well, he was sitting in trance. He had entered into samadhi. And at that time only, then Indra came out from his body. And then he killed him. But, but you could say, well, had he already gone back to Godhead? I, maybe not. No, it, says, it seems to say that in, in the presence of all the demigods, they saw the soul leave the body and go to the spiritual world to become an associate of Lord Sankarshan. But that, 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 and it says, it seems to say that happened after Indra come, came out and cut off his head.
but it could be also that you know that while he was still in trance that he'd al already left the body and gone back to Godhead. Just like Maharaj Parikshit was hearing Srimad Bhagavatam and then he sat in trance and then Tarksha the snake bird came to bite him. But Maharaj Parikshit was already in Samadhi, had already gone back to Godhead. And they just killed the dead body. Now Dronacharya, also Dronacharya stopped fighting, he sat down, he put, went into Samadhi, then they came and killed him. Yes, Maharaj, thank you very much. Definitely sinful reactions, but still, the, the, uh, although, although Vritasura was dead, and still he enters getting sinful reactions. So, it, it must be, there must be some message there for us, because it's, it's and Prabhupada writes, his offense was greater. Previously he killed Vrita Sura, it was in the spur of the moment, you know, it was a very quick thing, without deliberation. But here he's killing uh, Vrita Sura, and it's with the, the, the thinking is that he will kill Vrita Sura and then atone for it by performing some sacrifice. So that was wrong to think that he could do that and then atone for it by performing yajna. That kind of mentality is very condemned. So that's why he got the sinful reactions. But the austerities, and the, he, he underwent the purification, and then he, he worshipped the Lord after being in the stem of the lotus for a thousand years. Then he worshipped the Lord very intensely. And then he did, only then he was able to do Ashwamedha Yajna. Because without purifying himself, they couldn't do the Ashwamedha Yajna. He couldn't go there with all, you know, as a sinful person, he couldn't just go there and do Ashwamedha Yajna. Hmm. Yes, Prima? This is Maharaj, this is fine. So, Maharaj, suppose one devotee uh, incidentally kills a Vaishnav and Vaishnav immediately dies. So, can this rule be applicable to him? Somebody kills a Vaishnava? Uh, Vaishnava incidentally dies, suppose. So, there is no scope of apologizing from him. So, in Vato, he will reinstate himself in devotional journey? Well, he has to undergo some atonement. He has to, he has to accept some atonement for purification. He has to chant the holy name constantly. He has to beg for the mercy of devotees. He has to just co completely submit himself to the holy name and, and cry for his offence. Yeah, difficult to be relieved for killing a devotee. How do you get relief from that? It can, you can get relief, but you, you have to have that... You, you, you have to consider what is the mentality did he just spontaneously kill it and without, he wasn't thinking, but it just, out of the circumstances arose, but suddenly there was a, a argument, a disagreement, and he ended up killing someone? Or was it all premeditated and planned and that I will kill someone and then I'll chant the holy name to make up for it? You have to consider the circumstances. You see, Indra's circumstances were quite different. That he's been 
told by people to kill the demon. And then they're telling him, we will do the yagya to, so that you don't get sinful reactions. But still, personified sin came there after. So he, he had to, he couldn't immediately just go and do the Ashwamedha yagya. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think Krishna Prabhu. Uh, yes, Maharaj Ji, Dhanu Pranam. Uh, Maharaj, in the last uh, translation, uh, when, where all the benedictions are given after reading this uh, incidents, uh, one line states that uh, one will become expert in the activities of the senses. So, I didn't understand its meaning, Maharaj Ji. Where is it? Uh, in the translation of this last verse, uh, on the screen we can see, uh, yes, this, this verse, uh, the benedictions are given after reading the incidents. One of the benedictions is, uh, if one does so, one will become expert in the activities of the senses. One will Eighth become line. expert in what? In the activities of the senses. Oh, yeah. What is the meaning, Maharaj? I didn't understood it. Didn't understand. Mm, well, uh, in sense, sense ratification. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, I see now. All right. If one does not, if one does so, the learners should, are always advised to read this narration. If one does so. One will become expert in the activities of the senses. Well, what does it mean to be expert in the activities of the senses? It means you use your senses in the service of Krishna. The activities of the senses, we, we use our eyes to see. So we will see the scriptures, you can read the scriptures. You, you can use your ears for hearing the glories of the Lord. You can use your tongue for chanting the names of the Lord. And we use our legs to walk to the holy places. And so the activities of the senses should be used not for our own sense gratification, but for the pleasure of the Lord. That is the perfection of our senses. The senses belong to the Lord. They're meant for His service. So one who is expert in the activities of the senses he will be careful to use his senses for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. Have you, yes. got, have you got it? Yes, Maharaj. So, uh, we'll become very materially very, uh, qualified and, and a devotee will use all these things in the service of the Lord. Yes, can do. The, the, sometimes these kind of statements are made just to encourage people who are not very devoted. You see, sometimes these kind of benedictions are offered, and they will encourage the more uh, neophyte devotee, the more devotees who are they're more on the material platform. So these kind of benedictions will encourage them. And of course, if they will take, and they, if they do read and chant this pastime, they'll become more and more detached from all these desires. So we have, the, we have these kind of desires that are also offered in the worship of Lord Damodar during the month of Kartik, during Damodar Puja, we're told how worshipping Lord Damodar also will destroy a lot of sins and gives up a lot of benedictions and blessings. So these things are, they're not really for devotees. One who is a more advanced devotee is not interested in these things. He knows that's not real happiness. But these benedictions are offered just to encourage people who are not so advanced, not so fixed in pure devotion. Mm -hmm. Yes, Master. All right, any other question there? Did you write an essay on this unit yet? Did you get a topic to write an essay on? 
No, again. How many assists? How many assists do you have to write? Usually. One. Oh, what is it? We we pick one, and you all have to write that one, or do you? Anyway, I have we have to talk to whoever is coordinating this unit. What's his name again? Parthasarathi Mohan. So he's not here tonight, is he? No, he's not here, Maharaj. Okay, so maybe somebody should get in touch with him and ask him about what essay you're supposed to write. Do you, can you pick one of the three or are you, are you told which one to write on? But as to usually we are writing one essay per unit. One essay per unit. But do you all write on the same topic? Topic uh, we have to select. Okay, well, I have to, I have to, we have to check with him. I want to make sure that that's right, that you want to do it that way. We don't want you wasting your time. If he says do it one way and then you come along and do it another way, then it will be a problem. So yeah, anyway, tomorrow, tomorrow morning, somebody, or tonight even, somebody can check with him and ask him what... Uh, huh? Yes, Maharaj, yes. Yeah. All right, and, and then tomorrow we'll go on to chapter number 14 about King Chitraketu's lamentation. Maybe you could just read out the essay. What is that? What are the three essay topics? What's the first one? Mother, the essay topics, uh, SFR Unit 26 is uh, the three essays, as I said. Mm -hmm. One is understanding with reference to uh, Srimad Bhagavatam 6.7.124, dark through general principles for Indra's offending. Uh, Brihaspati and the demons worshipping Sukracharya discuss the relevance of these principles for Iskan devotees. Bri and, uh, Brihaspati and Sukracharya. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, the difference between the demons and the demigods. So the demigods had insulted their guru, and because they insulted their guru, they lost everything. But the demons. Although they were demons, they were victorious because they were very faithful to the instructions of Sukracharya. Okay, yes. And then what's the second essay? The second essay is preaching application from uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6, chapters 11-12. Draw to general principles from the incidents and discussions between Indra and Vitrasira. The relevance of these principles for preaching today. Oh, the in, the dis discussion between Vritasura and Indra, where Vritasura is talking about doing your duty and don't be attached to the results. Okay. Is it? Present the relevance of these principles for devotees for today. For preaching today, preaching application. Yes, very important in our preaching. We have to be dependent on Krishna. We're not the doer. We simply in endeavor for the service of Krishna. I gave the example, Lord Nityananda and Haridas, they were not successful. Don't be attached to the results. Just try to do our preaching and depend on Krishna for the results. But what example, Maharaj, you gave Haridas? I said Nityananda and Haridas went to Jaga and Madhai, they were not successful. The first attempt. And they came back again and Lord Nityananda got struck on the head. And Haridas was chanting the holy name. And he got whipped in mar 22 marketplaces for chanting the holy name, for becoming a devotee. And Lord Jesus Christ was crucified 
They accepted so much difficulties. They didn't give up and they didn't have bitter feelings. They continued their worship despite the hardships. What's the final, the third question? And it was in personal application with reference to Srimad Bhagavatam 6.10.214. Draw to general principles from Dadichi Muni's leaving his body. Oh, the... okay, Dadichi Muni leaving his body, principles. And so that was, that's a very nice section, Dadichi Muni giving up his body. And Prabhupada talks about how even young people today, they're encouraged to sacrifice their lives for the service of the Krishna Consciousness Movement. Just like Dadichi sacrificed his life for the demigods, for some higher purpose. Dadichi, Dadichi was detached. He said, the body will we have to give it up one day anyway, so I might as well give it up for a good cause. Let the body be used for some good purpose. So let me give up the body. And so he, the, the, his thinking, he wanted to do good for others. The, what, his compassionate and kind, caring, even the demigods. And detached, that vairagya. So these kind of principles there, compassion and detachment, these are some of the principles of Tadichi. And these are very important qualities today for devotees. And we are encouraged to follow the example of Dadichi. Use our life for the service of the Krishna Consciousness Movement. Help people to become self-realized. This is the Krishna Consciousness is the highest welfare work. Okay, so those are the three kind of essays, you know, nice questions. I don't know which one you have to write on, we'll find out. And maybe, who's going to ask, uh, who's going to ask, what's his name, Pratha Sarati? I will, I will definitely ask, I will ask Maharaj. Yeah, ask, Moving, ask him, is it, is, is it one or is it, can we pick any one or do we have to pick, do we just have to write on one particular essay? Or, I don't know, maybe he doesn't want an essay for this unit, maybe wait, wait till you do the next unit, you have to ask him. Anyway, tomorrow we'll begin the next unit, right? Chapter 14. We'll go on and hear chapter 14. We have five more classes to do in the next unit to finish the everything about Chitraketu and how he got cursed. All right? Any other question? Okay, so we'll meet you tomorrow night. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Yeah.